Are you puzzled by the latest Bitcoin price movements? One of the biggest questions I always get from traders is, Charlie, why did the S&P do this or why did Bitcoin do that? I usually just say to them, yeah, there was more buyers than sellers, you know. Is technical analysis the only tool to assess the market with? If technical analysis is uh, so great, uh, how come uh, people aren't rich and super rich and everyone is so successful? And what are the risks involved in crypto trading? Leverage. Leverage. Kills. It just does. Learn the basics of crypto trading and technical analysis with John Bollinger, Charlie Burton, Tone Vase, and Big Chunks. These are the highlights of Coin Telegraph Crypto Traders Live. I always prefer TA on the most liquid markets, and while I really like doing TA on the Bitcoin market, I hate uh, looking at TA in anything other than Bitcoin because it's just too liquid. And uh, it feels like penny stock trading, which I hated doing TA on as well. Oh yeah, I, I agree that TA for, for me works definitely best just using Bitcoin kind of as my standard there. I agree that a lot of the altcoins, especially the ones that have a lot of low liquidity, um, do trade and do look a lot like the penny stocks, which you really can't get the best TA on because you get wicks and crazy directions and you don't have really the volume that shows you the true uh you know price discovery you're looking for but in terms of bitcoin when we just start with basic ta moving averages exponential moving averages all the oscillators we use um they're very clear i feel in terms of what they're showing in terms of patterns and most recently here when we just had this breakout uh everything was kind of lining up that we were kind of have a very volatile move the bollinger bands of course on the daily chart were extremely tight pinching and showing that we were about to get something and then when you see where we are in terms of where we are in terms of the moving averages how the price action has been above the meaningful ones 50 day 100 and 200 um it seemed like the bulls had the upper hand on this and that's what we saw in the price action uh, uh charlie do you have anything to add on this um as far as i'm concerned um yeah I mean, I'm a technical analysis trader myself, but really, it's the one thing that I find we out there. It doesn't matter what market and what type of trader you're talking to, they all want to be right as much as possible. But I don't care about being right as much as possible, and we all know that you don't have to be right that frequently. And I think that's the main thing for me with technical analysis. It's not necessarily about trying to be right 80% of the time in your analysis. I'm quite prepared to be wrong. Um, as long as my risk reward is is there for me. So if I can get a half decent risk reward on some of these moves that are there, then does it matter if I'm wrong 50% of the time or even 60% of the time? It doesn't. Um, one of my most one of my best technical analysis strategies I have is actually about 40%, 40, 45% success rate. And yet it's the most profitable one that I have. No. So if you think about it, there are two two major avenues to profitability in technical trading, in all trading, for that matter. One is is your frequency. Um, what percentage of wins do you, do you have? Can be 40 percent, can be 60 percent. It, it, it's just a, a number. And the other is the size of your winners versus the size of your losers. So I'm guessing that uh, Charlie has a, a system. If it's only 40 percent um, effective, and um, but yet it's making money, so probably has a win loss ratio of two or three to one um, in terms of the size of the winners versus the size of the losers. And it, you know, if 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 starting traders would think about the relationship between those two sets of numbers and would really look at them in their own trading process, they would improve very quickly. I think uh, risk uh, management was just mentioned earlier. Uh, because technical analysis may not be the most important thing uh, in a trader's arsenal. So before we get on to the actual technical analysis tools, uh, I decided to really quickly um, grab uh, a slide from a recent uh, risk management uh, workshop that I did. And in this slide, uh, I'm literally, um, uh, I grabbed a page from uh, Wells Wilder Jr.'s book uh, from 1978, New Concepts in Technical Trading Systems. And it was like a 70 page, uh, uh, basically manifest on technical analysis with one page being, devo being devoted to risk management. And here's what he writes. Um, the message uh, of this book is that there are three parts to a good technical trading plan. 
uh, using a good technical system, using the system on the right markets at the right time, and using a good money management technique. Of the three, the third is the most important, being money management, the easiest to learn and the hardest to do. Uh, and then, um, and what I did with the slide, I basically said, hey, there are infinite amount of places where you can learn technical analysis. I teach technical analysis and I do my best to teach you proper risk management and how not to lose your entire account on one bad trade, but it's gonna be the hardest thing for you to do. But number two, I can't teach you. Using the right technical system on the right asset, on the right time frame. Uh, and I think that is also a challenge that a lot of traders need to solve. And those that can't solve it end up being followers of other traders. Uh, so what do you guys think about this dynamic of learning technical analysis, knowing how to apply technical analysis, and making sure that you have good uh, money management and risk management? Uh, so let's head over to uh, Charlie, and we'll start with you, uh, because you do um, have uh, groups and uh, newsletters. And what do you think about this dynamic, and how should a new trader manage this dynamic? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't have newsletters anymore. That was years ago, but um, but I do have groups. Yeah, I think the, there's a couple of things here. Um, if you're talking about groups and followers and stuff, and we all have them, um, is that a lot of people are looking for help and they're looking for people who have got experience in the markets um, for help. And so I'm quite happy to provide my experience in that in that regard. Wherever I can help people, then I, I, that's a good thing. Um as always, it is the most important thing as what we, we emphasize is good risk management. The problem that a lot of people have is they'll look at a chart if they're a technician or maybe if it's a fundamentals that are going on. And if they really believe that, that everything's lined up and as you guys know, sometimes you can look at a chart and you can think, wow, that has got everything lined up. And what happens to those average traders? They bet the farm on it because they think, well, all of my indicators are, are aligned. The heavens have aligned for me. And that's the natural tendency for most traders is to then think, right, I'm going to bet the farm on that. But so often the ones that we think are all lined up are the ones that actually fail. And the ones that we actually in our gut feel most uncomfortable about are the ones that actually work. So, um, yeah, coming back to your first point about risk management, I mean, we just say to our, our traders, risk up to 1% per trade. And if you stay below 1% per for every trade, then um, you're pretty much going to keep yourself safe. You can sustain a drawdown when drawdowns come along, but you can still make some um, decent gains and, and have some good results with that type of risk per trade. You can build your trades and build into them and do all of that sort of stuff. But if you start out at a maximum of up to 1% risk per trade, then I think that's always a good advice. There are two aspects um, to um, this risk management um, piece. Number one, uh, Charlie touched a little bit on it. I have to disagree with him a little bit. But, um, um, it's the amount committed to each trade. And, and there are very good formulas for determining how much you should commit to a given trade. I really commend everybody the work of Ralph Vince. He's done more on position sizing um, than I think anybody else. Um, it's very mathematical. And if, if that's... Um, to a little bit too mathematical for you. Um, perhaps um, another practitioner, Van Tharp, um, who has written extensively on position sizing, um, might um, contribute to that. The second thing is, um, the second portion of, of money management for me, other than position sizing, is some sort of risk control. Um, I personally like trailing stops. Um, I, I've, I've written a couple of my own trailing stops. But um, Wells Wilder suggested one, it's called parabolic. It's sort of a relentless approach to a trading stop um, in that it increments each and every period, no matter what. Um, I prefer um, the work by, uh, of Chuck LeBeau. Um, these are called chandelier stops um, and they progress as the trade progresses. So if the trade stalls, the stop will stall. That's the big difference between the, those two approaches. But they're, they're, they're both progressive levels um, that will keep you out of trouble. So position sizing is absolutely key. Um, I, I think you should try to determine what it is in a formulaic manner. 
Um, but you know, a fixed a fixed number can 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 work as well. Um, and then the second piece is is some sort of risk control, and for that, um, it's trailing stops for me. All right, and uh, Big Jonas, uh, tell us about your uh, any like lessons that you in your uh, you said you've been trading for about seven years. Uh, any uh, horrifying experience of not following good risk management rules you want to share? Sure, all, all the time, actually. Um, you know, being able to control FOMO in this market is incredibly important. Uh, Bitcoin, for the most part, tends to range. And then every once in a while, like we've seen uh, the past week or so, has a big move. Uh, so it's great that you're able to capitalize on those big moves. But during the times of consolidation and ranging, uh, the wicks we, 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 we see because of the leverage uh, market that Bitcoin is in in both directions can wreck an account, especially a uh, account you use on leverage trading. So, um, you know, in terms of me and how I uh, approach risk management, A, obviously, never want to put all your eggs in one basket or one trade. There's always another trade. You know, if you have a, a chart that you're watching and you miss your ideal entry or it, it does something and you just aren't there to make the trade, um, preventing yourself from chasing into the trade after you've missed your ideal entry is so important. Um, as And the more I trade, the more I become more conservative I, I've found in my trading. Uh, I, I When you're new to trading, the um, temptation to uh, up your leverage and to turn a thousand, make a thousand look like 50,000 with like a, you know, 10x move or a 50x uh, trade uh, and thinking about, oh my God, I could make a ton of money if Bitcoin has a huge pop there. Uh, but what the crypto markets tend to do is to kind of screw people on both ends of the trade. You'll get your Darth Malwick that's that liquidates your longs, liquidates your shorts. And in the end, the closing body kind of stays more or less where it was. And that's what we continue to see uh, in this Bitcoin market. So um, preserving capital risk management uh, is the most important thing, because I think the term wrecked is, is thrown around a lot these days because people get wrecked very easily. And the volatility in these markets, especially in altcoins, can come so quick. And if you don't have a stop loss in, if you're not protecting your capital, and if you're not protecting your winners, you know, it's okay to take a win. I think people, when they're up in a trade um, and they're not used to being up in a trade, don't know what to do. They're thinking they hit the generational entry, if you will, and they're kind of just let it ride. And those are never, they, they just never work out that way. You know, I, that's why I look at trading as terms of, you know, scalping and swing trading um, and each trade individually. I'll take a lot of trades and try and make a few bucks on each trade. Uh, we're going to kick this one off with uh, uh, Mr. Bollinger uh, and I'm going to get very specific. Uh, we're going to get right to the meat. Uh, what are your favorite technical analysis tools? But I'm going to uh, remove the obvious stuff. Uh, so. Uh, no candlestick patterns, uh, no chart patterns like triangles or cups and handles, no moving averages. So we're talking straight up TA tools. Uh, name three. One of them can be an overlay like Bollinger Bands or Ichimoku Clouds or, uh, you know, Parabolic Star or something overlays on the price. And two of them, oscillators. Your MACD, your RSI, your ADX, you know, have at it. So what are your favorite uh, TA tools that aren't obvious that everyone else uses. So this is what we call a fat pitch, huh? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's obvious. For me, it's Bollinger Bands um, uh, as the overlay. And then the two indicators that I would use as oscillators are percent B, which tells us where we are in relation to the Bollinger Bands, and bandwidth, which tells us how wide the Bollinger Bands are. Um, but, you know, ha having said that, there are... In, in, especially in the crypto space, there are a ton of other TA tools that work really well. Um, we, we talked here a, a, a bit about moving averages and, and such. They, they can provide some useful information. The classic um, overbought, oversold oscillators such as RSI and stochastics are, are quite useful. And I really like intermarket analysis in the crypto space. So I, I don't look at the, 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 the tiny illiquid coins. Um, I do um, 
um, I do watch an index of them um, that um, shit perp um, index. Uh, I find that that pretty useful. But I look at the um, I look at the other major coins where there's a lot of activity, Ether and Litecoin, stuff like that. Um, and I think um, that goes that work goes back all the way to Bill Ohama um, writing so long ago. He called it his 3D method of of trading is just look at related things and see if they're if they're confirming your analysis. And I find that very, very useful in the crypto space. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, Charlie, let's go over to you. OK, so very briefly, I do use moving averages. So I've taken quickly taken those off. <laughs> as you said, they're not allowed. <laughs> um, but as you can see on the chart here, I've taken some moving averages off, but um, I've got I use a MACD. Um, I like using an NMACD indicator for um, divergences. I find that works really well against support or resistance. Um, so that's a favorite of mine. And just price action and trend lines and um, horizontal support and resistance, literally just putting on those horizontal support and resistance. This is a, a chart of, funnily enough, euro dollar. I know we're talking Bitcoin, but I've just brought this one up because I think this has been a beautiful pattern for such a long time. This building uh, long-term trend line going all the way back to 2001. If I actually put this onto a uh, maybe a quarterly chart, you'll be able to see it a little bit easier here. There we go. All the way back to 2000, this beautiful long-term trend line that we keep on coming back down and, and bouncing around. That's what we're bouncing off at the moment. Then we've got this declining trend line from the, the highs of 2008-9. And so um, that's a to me is a beautiful chart there. And that's why I've been observing that. We've got a couple of horizontal um, areas of um, actually the first red line here, um, that that first red line going back to 2015, that around two, um, one, uh, 114 on euro dollar has been kept on coming back up to test it. And I love it when price comes up to a resistance level or a support level and just keeps on bouncing against it, against it because at some point it's probably going to break through as you know under technical analysis rules. So um, basics really, price action, um, horizontal support and resistance and trend lines and a MACD. There you go. That's what I use. Charles, what about you? What are your favorite uh, technical analysis tools other than uh, uh, so one overlay and two oscillators? So um, I try and find what are the best RR setups for me, you know, best risk reward. So I'll, I'm not uh, kissing up here, but the Bollinger bands are a big part of my TA. I do like to use them. I have rules for how the price action responds on, let's say, the one hour chart, uh, the six hour chart, and the daily chart. I'm very curious in terms about the higher time frames as well. In terms of my oscillators, I really like to use the RSI and the stochastic RSI. Um, I uh, adjust my RSI and stoke settings slightly higher. The default for the RSI is. 70 30 i go 80 20 and then the solve for the stochastic is is 80 20 i go 90 10 and basically what that means for me is when the stochastic rsi uh when both of our indicators are swimming above 90 or below 10. Um, those are uh, times when I'm saying, okay, is this an opportunity to long or to short? I do not long when the 15 minute RSI and stochastic RSI are above these you know, lines uh, and I would consider a short or I, I, I consider a long and would never short if they're on the lower end of the oscillator spectrum. And that just gives me a sense of where we are in the overall uh, kind of wave pattern and where I can have my, my best chance to trade. When these oscillators are kind of in the middle, for me, that's kind of no man's land and I don't see the clear signal uh, to potentially take a trade. So I'm looking for extremes in those oscillators, mostly on lower time frames because I'm more of a scalper and then try and take advantage of those. And those kind of offer me my best RR. I was just going to add, actually, I was just interested in the overbought stochastics RSI. I mean, I the one, uh, it's just interesting just because for me, I'll, I'll look at a, a chart like that if I put those indicate types of indicators on. If I see them overbought, um, we all know that markets can remain overbought for longer than you, you think. So is there another trigger that you'll use? Because sometimes you'll get your RSI or your stochastic or get up there and it will sort of just wiggle along the top and the, as the market just trends. So do you use anything else to actually help you to decide that actually this is coming off and it's not actually just a strong trend? 
So these rules work best for me in a five and a 15 minute time frame. I absolutely agree with you, especially in Bitcoin, that on the higher time frames, daily, weekly, especially, you can have uh, oscillators pegged way high. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's overbought, therefore I must sell. Uh, we saw clearly with the weekly uh, stochastic RSI that it was pegged at almost 100 uh, for weeks, basically, during the big run of 2019 and a very frothy RSI as well. So uh, you're absolutely right that a market can range uh, and still rise while these uh, oscillators are at their peaks. Um, but that's why I only use these specifically for the very lower time frames, because I'm not looking for a trend change. I'm looking for an opportunity of a, of, of a scalp trade. Hey guys, so let's move on to this dynamic between fundamental trading and technical analysis. So technical analysis is basically a new tool and uh, the millennials and the new generation is falling more and more in love with it. But, the, uh, but how much are the big institutional markets uh, are taking uh, TA seriously? Uh, and uh, do you think that the amount of people that are investing in general uh, is rising uh, for the, uh, more towards the TA side because institutionals are still all about fundamental analysis. And uh, what do you think that dynamic is? And do you think an at-home retail trader even has a chance to compete in the fundamental analysis game? Because I honestly don't think he does, but I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, the, the FA part of Bitcoin is really fascinating. It kind of, there's a, there's so much more than, than TA that is available to analyze. Uh, with Bitcoin, you know, on-chain volume and other indicators, minor profitability, all these things that you don't necessarily see on your Bitcoin chart, but have a, can have a tremendous impact in the price action or determining what the future price action can be. Um, I think a lot of altcoins tend to drive on news events, uh, potential partnerships with uh, bigger companies or something that tend to kind of move the price action sometimes more than the actual uh, chart is suggesting. So um, FA does play a, a big role in this. And I think what I'm trying to do is enhance my FA side. You know, I feel like I'm pretty strong on the TA side, but in terms of the FA side, when it comes to Bitcoin, there's a tremendous amount that you can study that can give you uh, a lot more insight and data, I think, than the TA side can necessarily show you. Uh, and Charlie, what do you think about the fundamental analysis versus uh, TA analysis? And uh, what do you think about people tend to confuse news events that they hear with fundamental analysis? Because I always love to separate the two. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I think it comes down to our innate human nature. We need to understand why something happened. And fundamental analysis sort of helps our that, that inner desire for people to be able to justify why something's happened. One of the biggest questions I always get from traders is, Charlie, why did the S&P do this? Or why did Bitcoin do that? And there has to be a reasoning and a sort of a fundamental reasoning as to why Bitcoin break out, broke out last week and or the beginning of this week. And I, I usually just say to him, yeah, there was more buyers and sellers, you know, but, um, but coming back to your point as well about um, fund managers and what the, and, and, and this snobbery sort of element to or we, we don't use technical analysis and yet you look at some of the greatest traders you know of all time and um, you know, I always go back to the likes of market wizards and you look at Paul Tudor Jones and Ed Sakota and, and uh, Richard Dennis and some of these famous traders they used a lot of technical analysis in their approach so um, and I think for um, certainly for the average retail trader who is probably trading over a shorter time frame, then market sentiment is more important in the shorter term than fundamentals, in my view. So, and you can derive market sentiment from the charts a lot of the time and from obviously sentiment measures themselves. So I think for the big players, the big funds, then fundamentals are important because they're trying to understand those macro trends, which are important to the time horizon that they're looking at. But a trader who's looking to be in today and be out next week, I don't think it's as much. Personally, I don't think it's as important. There's a the point to make on Charlie's idea there is that, you know, there are no people that do not use technical analysis. 
It doesn't exist. There are no pure fundamentalists. They just simply don't exist. You show me a fundamentalist that has never looked at a chart, and I will show you a pure fundamentalist. But they all look at charts, right? So it's, it's a really important point. They're all practicing rational analysis. They're all using technical analysis. They're just not admitting it. So here comes a tough one to put you guys on the spot. Um, if technical analysis is uh, so great, uh, how come uh, people aren't rich and super rich and everyone is so successful uh, trading? And why is it difficult? I have my answer, but you guys are the panelists. Why is it so difficult to wrap your best technical analysis thinking into a script that automatically trades your market profitably per perpetually? Uh, what is the uh, what is holding that up? So uh, uh, I guess you know. Let's start with showing us on this one. Yeah, it's understanding how to trade a specific time frame. You know, if you're using TA based on a one hour or a four hour, uh, it, it feels like it's very important to have a, a sense of that particular trade. That's for for me would be more of a swing trade. Uh, I would expect to be in this trade uh, for hours, a day, maybe several days because I'm on that higher time frame. If I'm on a lower time frame of five or 15, I'm looking for a scalp trade. I don't expect to be in this trade more than 10 minutes to a half hour, probably max, um, or else I probably didn't have like the 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 the, the, the best entry in it. Uh, it's a great question because we, we have these tools that are supposed to show us the way uh, either here's a buy signal or a sell signal but the markets don't necessarily then trend in in one direction like straight up or straight down along the way you get your your troughs wick stop outs uh throughout it so even though you can have the best ta and really trust your tools uh then you have the 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 forces of other traders uh bot trading uh the exchanges themselves and it's it behooves the exchanges to get you out of your position you know so you're kind of fighting against all these things uphill so i trust my ta but you have to understand how to use it in the context of the time frame you're actually applying it to all right uh charlie let's go over to you and we'll save john for last on this one <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to pick up on the first element of your question which is why a technical analyst not not rich or whatever it was you said something about the richest well, well, people some of some of them are some of them are but there's okay. this expectation that if I learn technical analysis I will be a gazillionaire and there's reality somewhere in the middle between those two yeah, yeah. I mean, well, certainly the average retail trader, the problem they have is they have a very short time horizon. They think that they can read a book and then become, a, as you said, a gazillionaire. And, and they forget about this whole thing called volume in the market. And that they think that if I just carry on compounding at 10% a month and I start off with my £10,000 uh, or $10,000 account, then yeah, I'll be worth trillions in a few years' time. It doesn't quite work that way. But um, the other thing with, with most um, technicians, well, as you said there, um, the good guys um, either just carry on just trading their own money or actually become money managers. And so and the very wealthiest people, traders out there, are money managers. Just mention any any name. And um, John, I'm sure you've been a money manager and maybe you still are. Sorry. I, I, yeah. So the wealthiest guys tend to manage other people's money because it's the easiest way to um, to trade very large sums and to derive uh, fee performance fees on the back of that. Yeah, I, I would say that the, the, the reason for lack of uh, uh, success, uh, whether it's huge success or just success period, there are two reasons. Uh, um, first of all, um, discipline, lack, specifically a lack thereof, and emotions which cause a lack of discipline. Um, though that's the big problem um, for traders. And then, you know, if you want to have one more um, piece in, in that puzzle, um, leverage. Leverage kills. It just does. Every time. You look at every major financial problem, and it, it, the bottom line was leverage every single time. So the overuse of leverage um, allowing emotions to rule your process and the lack of discipline. Those are the reasons that people don't get wealthy or even rich or, or do well or lose all their money. 
All right. I have a follow-up question uh, to money management, but we have a good question from the audience uh, that uh, fits into exactly what we were talking about. Are bots better than humans in, at trading? Are emotional trades uh, a good thing for market volatility? So what are your thoughts on uh, putting your ideas into a bot uh, versus uh, have, uh, doing it yourself? Like, like, or does it depend on the person? Bots are uh, fun. They, 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 they work perfectly well um, as long as the market as long as the market remains kind. When the market turns wicked, the bot dies. Um, that's just it. And if you're if you're fast enough to turn it off um, and and pick another approach or another bot, then you know you can be successful at that. But bots only mat trade are able to trade the markets that they're matched to, and and markets evolve and change all the time. So there you go. And how do bots affect technical analysis? Do you guys think, uh, Charlie? Go ahead. Feel free to answer both questions. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I've never been a fan of of bots. You know, you look at um, the institutions; they have very very deep pockets for developing all sorts of elaborate quantitative systems, um, and yet you get your average retail trader who want to develop a bot um, and have it scalping all day long. And the problem is with sh very short time frames, is that there's always going to end up being execution errors at some point, even with a, with a system. So my view is that yes, they are useful, but as a, as a supporting tool to the trader. So they can be a great support tool from um, from a back from a testing perspective, and from an alert perspective. But the trader still uses their skills to then take the signal and decide whether that signal is a good signal or not. Much like any discretionary trader, anyone here who we are all looking at the charts. I'm a top-down trader. I use the higher time frames and go down to the smaller time frames, and so, and and you can make that that decision based on your experience as a trader but if you're just letting a robot just trade it's not really going to be able to do all of that and as you said they they can come and go very easily with the market environment when that changes just like what we saw back in february march of this year and so i, I i'm i'm more pro full automated bots if they are trading off of higher time frames um than if they're getting caught up trying to scalp all day long, which I think are much more dangerous in my view. Uh, so this is my last question to you guys. And um, uh, you know what, let's kick it off with, uh, with you, John. Uh, if you can go back in time and give a young you, uh, you know, some advice about technical analysis, uh, what would it be and at what point in your life? Um it would be to get much more serious about technical analysis much sooner um, and um, to pay a lot of attention to the classics. Those books that were written 50, 60, 80 years ago um, by the likes of Wyckoff and Drew and, and Edwards and McGee like that. That, that would be me. Uh, Charlie, how about you? Uh, to my young self, I would say focus. Um, one of the the one thing that I did, in, and like most traders do in the early years, and is I was a searcher, like so many people are, and I went from system to system, from indicator to indicator, and never really got anywhere. And the late Mark Douglas, um, I met him in, uh, maybe twenty years ago, and I remember him saying to me, "If you locked yourself in a tr in a in a prison cell for six months, and I just gave you a 10 period moving average, I bet you after seven, uh, six months, you'd be able to make money because that's all you had. The problem we all have nowadays is so much choice that we we just jump around too much. So if I could go back to my former self, then I'd say focus on a few things and get really good at those. Uh, Charles, how about you? Uh, knowing when to take a win has been one of my uh, things I've been battling with the trader for a while when you're in a winning trade protecting that is so important i can't tell you how many times when as a young trader i was in a winning trade that became a losing trade very quickly because i just didn't want to take the win <clears throat> i wanted higher i wanted more and in waiting and not selling it it just cost a lot of money and 
real quick, uh, you know, scaling into trades, you never will hit the nut bottom or the nut top. But if you don't scale in, if you put all your eggs in one initial entry, you don't have the leeway to dollar cost into that trade more effectively. So nibble into a trade, nibble into a position and you'll have more options on uh, how you can trade it. Once again, we had uh, Big Chonus, uh, Charlie Burton, and the one and only John Bollinger. Thank you so much, guys, for joining this Coin Telegraph trading experience. Uh, it's been awesome. Thank you, guys. Ta -ta. Thank you. Thank you. Coin Telegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl. Thank <laughs> you.